Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the Employment Law Show. Good to have you along for the ride the next half hour. I'm John Scholes, Lior Sanfuru as well. Of course, employment lawyer, Sanfuru Tamarkin, LLP. We always tell you off the top of every show to reach out to Lior with any concerns, employee, employer, severance problem, workplace problem. It, uh, it doesn't matter. Always have that number with you. 1-855-821-5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca. Uh, reach out through email, which we're going to get through a little later on the show. Plus some phone calls from our long-running radio shows across the country pretty much. You, uh, you call us every week. A lot of you join us on the radio show as well. Call in with your questions. We love that because uh, you get some answers, which is always good. But then it gives us content for the TV show, which makes everybody that much smarter. So, uh, in, again, go to employmentlawyer.ca. Find a radio station Close to your jurisdiction, you can join us on air and uh, make that phone call. That's coming up, plus times when an employment lawyer can help. Pretty much everything to do on the show, but we're going to narrow it down to a few in just a bit. But, pal, we always start off with the, uh, the week that was a case of the day. What do you got cooking? Hi, uh, John. Great to be here, as always, to talk about this very important topic. I want to make sure that our good viewers understand this issue, that you know your rights. We're going to make it even, even out the playing field a bit. Oftentimes, employers may know rights. They may not share that with you. Well, employees don't usually know. If you watch this show, if you listen to us on radio, as John was saying, you will learn so much about your rights, what the law can do for you. It's okay to ask, hey, what can the law do for me? It can do a lot, certainly when it comes to your workplace rights. It can make sure you're properly compensated. It can make sure you're treated properly in the workplace. It can make sure that your job doesn't change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have rights. And on this show, we'll explain how the law works, what to do if you're facing a workplace problem, and of course, where to go to for help. We, uh, we're here often on TV, on radio, but beyond that, you can reach me in the office always. We'll give you that contact information throughout the show. But let me start off with the situation that came across my desk over the past week. I spoke with a gentleman who for a while was getting into arguments with his employer. Why? Because his employer was not paying him for overtime. Uh, so he was working overtime. This gentleman, good employee, conscientious employee, worked often many hours to get his job done. And his employer really didn't see the value and said, no, no, you really don't need to work that much. It's on you that you're working that much. We didn't ask you to work that much, so you're not going to get overtime. And this went back and forth for a few months, back and forth, and arguments. Finally, this employee had enough say, well, if you're not going to pay me for the work that I do, if you're not going to value what I do, I'm going to leave. So he called me and he wanted to say, to, to understand, can he get paid for overtime? He calculated that he was owed about six, seven thousand dollars in overtime. That's a lot of money, of course. And he wanted to know if he can get it. So there's a few things here. The first thing is that, yes, of course he can get his overtime. If you worked overtime, you have to get paid for it. It doesn't matter if the company didn't ask you. In fact, even if the company asks you not to work overtime, you still have to get paid as long as the work that you did was legitimate and necessary to get the job done. So yes, he can get paid for his overtime. doesn't matter what the company wants to do. But it's more interesting than that. Because he wasn't paid what he was legally owed, he ended up leaving. The law considers this to be a constructive dismissal. He didn't leave because they didn't feel like working there. He left because he wasn't getting paid properly, because the company wasn't living up to its end of the bargain, which is to pay what it owed. So in this situation, not only is he owed his $6,000 in overtime, he could potentially be owed $50,000 in severance as well. He'd been there for a while. He could easily be owed eight or nine months of severance. So I can help him get that, but I wanted to remind our viewers, whether you're an employee or employer, yes, overtime has to be paid if you work it. But beyond that, failure to pay you what you're owed, whether it's overtime, vacation pay, your wages, your bonus, that could be a constructive dismissal. Of course, before you quit, unlike what this guy did, before you quit, I want you to call me. We need to do this correctly. But those are your rights. So even if he was told, look, I know you're not getting your work done, which would be weird for an employer to say, but uh, don't work the overtime. We're not going to pay for it. So you have a boss. I got to get it done. So you do it anyway, because as you said, conscientious, conscientious employer, I got to get my work done. He's kind of, you got to feel like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place a bit, right? Yeah, if you don't work, you're going to get into trouble for not getting the job done. Right. You work, they don't want to pay you. Well, maybe this employer thought that he could have gotten the job done in less hours. The reality is he did the work. It was legitimate. The employer had to pay for it. It's illegal not to pay for overtime. Depending on where you are, what province, there's different thresholds for overtime in terms of when do you have to get paid. 
But if you work the overtime, you have to get paid for that overtime. Situation where you want to keep pretty accurate records. I mean, if you never work overtime, maybe not as much. But if it's a regular thing, you should keep a written diary of how much you work because it becomes uh, he said, she said situation, right? Believe it or not, when it comes to overtime, if you say that you worked overtime, unless the employer can prove otherwise, you get paid for that overtime. Wow. So for employers, yes, if you're going to have employees working, you need to have a way to track their hours of work, whether it's a punch out system or some other log, because if an employee says, yeah, I worked 60 hours this week, and if you're the employer, you cannot prove otherwise, you have to pay them for those hours. How about people saying, okay, Leo, I get it, but I'm a salaried employee. I don't work hourly, so the overtime for me is kind of a, a bit of a strange animal. How do you calculate it? So overtime is paid even for those employees that get salary. Whatever hours you work, for example, in Ontario, overtime is paid over 44 hours a week. So whatever you get paid in a week, you divide that by 44, that gets you an hourly rate, and time and a half is your overtime rate. So yes, you have to get paid for overtime, even if you're on a salary. As we mentioned off the top of the show, join us on the radio show anytime, employmentlawyer.ca, to find a station near you where you can tune in and call into the show. Phone calls uh, this half hour for sure. We'll get to our first one right now and talk a little bit about it. Here it comes. So I was recently let go from my company that I had been there for over a year, and I was let go with no cause. They only gave me a week severance. So you've been there about a year, and what kind of a mm -hmm. job? What were you doing there? Project manager for a construction company. All right. And how old are you? 41. A lot of people wouldn't even call. They figure, a year, a week per year. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. That's good. Or maybe if they were generous, they'll say maybe two weeks you get. Right. So maybe they underpaid you by a week, but it's not much. Right. Well, here's the thing. That's wrong. When it comes to short service employees, we talked about this before, you have significant entitlements. Short service employees, even though you may have worked for a year or less, you could have significant termination entitlements that are calculated in months, not days, not even weeks. In fact, short service employees, as I've said before, are treated disproportionately better than longer service employees. So yes, you could have worked for a few months and be owed a few months of severance. That's how the law operates. So I want you to remember that and call me if you lose your job. Doesn't matter if you've worked there for a short period of time. Now for this particular caller that we've played right now, let's crunch the numbers. Let's see how much she is owed. We're gonna go to the severance calculator tool. You can find that of course at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca free and anonymous, let's put the information into the severance calculator and let's see how much severance she's owed. So we know she's been there for about a year, she is in her 40s and she's in a project manager role. Company says one week's pay, that's all you get. What you see on the screen right there, four to six months. Four to six months is how much she is owed. That's a massive difference, John, and, and that's why I always say short service employees should contact me as soon as you lose your job. And why is it so disproportionate? Because most people say that seems like a lot of severance for a one-year employee. Well, we have to go back to understand why is severance even paid to someone. It's paid to someone to help them bridge the gap between the job that they used to have and the new job that they're going to have. So it accounts for how long it should take you to find another job. Well, just because you work somewhere for a short period of time doesn't mean you're going to find a job within a week. It's still going to take you potentially a few months to find a job. So that's why short service employees are still going to be owed months of severance. In some situations, the length of severance could be more than the length of employment. Important to remember that. As Lior just mentioned, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, the website to go and use that severance calculator on your own. He can do it in his head, but you can use that tool. It's free and anonymous, no problem. Uh, second phone call. This one's very important. Have a listen to this as we get into it. I've been working for about 12 years with this company. I'm now in line for a promotion. They've, they've offered me a, a different position and a promotion, but they want me to sign a new employment contract. Mm -hmm. Contract has a clause for severance saying that I agree to accept the minimum requirements as per the Employment Standards Act of Ontario. Walk the other way, man. That's not yeah, good. no, don't walk the other way. Run the yes. other way and, and, and don't look back. Well, the reality is any time, any time, your employer comes to you and says, I want you to sign an employment agreement, a new employment agreement, that's bad news. And in this particular case, he knows it's bad news. He has a, he's already observed that the new employment agreement has a termination clause. The effect of that is this. If he signs this agreement and at some point down the road he is let go, he's now going to only get a fraction of his full severance because he signed an agreement that limits his severance. That could cost him and it will cost him 
tens of thousands of dollars, potentially more than that. So be very concerned anytime your employer wants you to sign a new employment agreement. Send me a copy of it. Let me read it. Let me tell you what it says and what it does before you sign it. I want you also to remember, you cannot be disciplined. You cannot be fired for cause for not signing an employment agreement. And in most cases, you're better off to tell your employer, thanks employer, but I'm okay with the way things are right now. I'm not signing that employment agreement. If you sign it, that could be very problematic, so let me help you out. The phone calls on the show come in threes, but we're going to do it on the other side of the break and then get to our main topic, of course, at that time, the times you really need to reach out to Leora, an employment lawyer in your life. That's on the way here on the Employment Law Show. In the meantime, write the number down. Keep it. Keep it on your phone, 1-855-821-5900. Help at employmentlawyer.ca. There's more coming up. Stick with us. People think contractors aren't owed severance. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just going to walk away. Your insurer may ignore you, they may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back, and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. All right, welcome back. Employment Law Show, John Scholes here in Lior Samfiru. Of course, reach out to Lior anytime the show's not on air. Have a conversation on your own time, 1-855-821-5900. Help at Employment Lawyer. We didn't mention the phone calls. How do we get those from our radio shows pretty much uh, across the country and outside of Quebec anyway? You want to uh, join in, go to the website employmentlawyer.ca, find a radio station close to you and tune in and call in. Phone call number three is coming up right now. I'm trying to help a colleague of mine. She's been with the company for about 15 years, under a new manager for the last six months, and just seems to be kind of targeted, very minor indiscretions, getting a write-up, copying senior management, and it's that have never really been an issue in the past. In a situation like that, where it just seems to be kind of vexation, the manager seems to be almost like building a case. Trying to give him the old... Punt, it looks like. Working on it, right? Well, certainly it seems like someone's spidey sense is tingling, and yeah. I think for good reason. Usually, John, when a company does this, all of a sudden they write you up for things that they weren't doing before. Nothing that you can do is okay, even though in the past everything was fine. Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is they're probably trying to build the case to fire you for cause. So whenever you're in a situation where your employer all of a sudden is very difficult on you, you can't do anything right, you get written up for the smallest things, you just seem like everything you do is wrong. Well, oftentimes that's just a step towards the company trying to put themselves in a position where they can say, we have to let you go for cause, there's nothing we can do. Well, what do you do about that? The worst thing you can do is just be silent, to say nothing, to put your head down and continue working. By doing that, it's the same as if you said, yes, you're right, I made a mistake, you're a completely correct employer. If you do that, you're making it so much easier for the company to let you go for cause. Don't do that. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to say in writing, of course, why you don't agree with it. If you think it's excessive, if you think the company has not considered certain things, write back to the company. Send an email and say, you wrote me up for this issue. Here's why it happened, or here's what you didn't know, or here's why I don't think it's fair. By doing that, by sending those simple emails, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your job, you're making it much more difficult for the company to even consider letting you go. So protect yourself by saying something. If you're not sure how to do it, if you're not sure if you should, always reach out to me. And if the employer doesn't respond? You don't need that response. All you need is to be able to show that you've sent that email. That's why I say email as opposed to talking to your employer, because then they can deny ever hearing anything. Send that email. If the company doesn't respond, it's fine. If they respond, it's fine as well. What I care about is that you send that email. Main topic, as mentioned, here we go. We're going to get into it. Times when an employment lawyer can help. The number one, kind of obvious, but we've got to put it in there when you lose your job, right? 
So most of what I do, most of what an employment lawyer does is help individuals that have lost their jobs. People call me when they're staring at that severance letter, and the reason why they do that is because in most cases, what's in that severance letter, completely inadequate. Now, I can't get you your job back in most cases because the law does not provide that as a remedy. The law does not have a mechanism to get your job back, but what the law does do is make sure that you're properly and legally uh, compensated if you lose that job. In most cases, you've been offered severance. That severance is a lot less than what you're owed, and I do mean a lot less. It can be two months offer owed 12 months. So what I do, what an employment lawyer does, is negotiate proper severance, get you the amount that you are legally owed, and oftentimes that's a very significant amount. Remember, if you sign off on that severance letter, can't help you. So that's why you call me before you do that to make sure you get what you're owed. Another reason to reach out to Lior, another employment lawyer, significant changes are made to your job without your consent. So you know, hopefully our, our regular uh, listeners and viewers know that an employer does not have a right to make significant changes to the terms of employment. They can't just reduce your pay. They can't just relocate you. They can't demote you. And if your employer does that, that could be a constructive dismissal. The reason you contact me is because if you do nothing, if you just continue working, you're considered to have accepted it and given the company the right to do it again. Not a good thing at all. So in many situations where the company is implementing a change, that change is not legal. And the remedy that's available, what, where I do, what I do to help people is to get them out of that workplace, get them severance so that they can move on to a different job. Employers have a little bit of wiggle room? Like a tiny bit, maybe? Yes. So I'm certainly not uh, going to suggest that an employer can do nothing, not at all. An employer can make some changes. I'll give you an example. You know, if you're working 9 to 5, yes, your employer can change it to 9.30 to 5.30. Maybe that makes you unhappy, and I get that. It's considered a, uh, not, not a significant change. But if instead of 9 to 5, they're going to do it 12 to 8, that's a big deal. That's a significant change. That can absolutely be a constructive dismissal. How about this? When a disability issue is involved, there's a big one where you need to reach out to Lior. So there's many things that can happen if you're off on a disability or you're sick, unable to work. Your employer may not allow you to... to Go, go off on disability. They may say you have to be back by a certain time. They may not listen to your doctor. You may need accommodation. You may have an insurance company that's supposed to pay you benefits that refuses or cuts you off. So there's a, unfortunately a variety of different issues that arise when someone has a disability, when they're unable to work. But the good news is the law provides very good remedies uh, all the time when it comes to those issues. You have rights under legislation, you have rights under common law. So if you have an issue with your employer, with your insurance company because of a disability, an important and a vital time to call. Talking about times when an employment lawyer can really help, number four, Lior, when the company ends your independent contractor arrangement. So you hopefully know by now where I'm gonna go with this, and that is the idea that most people that think that they're independent contractors are really employees. They've been misclassified as independent contractors. Remember, it doesn't matter what you think you are or what you've signed. If you look like an employee and act like an employee, no surprise, you're an employee. Well, what happens if you lose that job? Oftentimes, the company that you work for is gonna say, Oh, no, you're not an employee. You're an independent contractor, so we're not going to pay you anything. We're just going to wish you goodbye, and, and that's it. Well, not so fast. If you truly are an employee, but you've been misclassified, then you're owed severance. That could be as much as two years' pay. So if you're an independent contractor that believes you've been misclassified, certainly if you've lost your job, an ideal time to call. Certainly, uh, indeed, uh, Lior, fifth one and final one for the show uh, today, this topic, when workplace harassment is impacting your ability to work. Yeah. You know, when I started practicing 20-somewhat years ago, not too many people were calling with issues surrounding harassment. It wasn't just something that people were talking about. Well, guess what? Right now, it's different. People understand that they have a right to work in a healthy, in a positive, supportive work environment. You shouldn't be harassed. You shouldn't be bullied or mistreated in the workplace, regardless who is doing that. And what I often do is get employees out of that difficult workplace situation or deal with the employer to force the employer to make changes to rectify that situation. So definitely the lesson and the message here is if you're dealing with a workplace harassment situation, there's options, there's rights, and oftentimes, as I say, it starts by giving me a call.
good stuff. We hope you got all five of those. If not, reach out to Lior any time to go through some of the more issues on your own. As we get into a break here, we're going to go to a website on the other side called terminationquestions.com. That is on the way as we continue more of the Employment Law Show. Stick with us. People think you have to sign back a severance offer by a deadline. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Deadlines are used as a pressure tactic. Make sure the offer is fair before you sign. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. Can insurance companies deny long-term disability claims for mental illness? When you're suffering from a mental health disability, insurance companies just don't understand. But we do. They can absolutely not force you back to work. If your doctors say you are not ready and you know you're not ready, they cannot make you go back to work. If you have a mental health disability and your claim is denied, don't give up. Give us a call and let us fight for you. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you aren't owed severance pay if you are fired for a reason. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Most for-cause terminations are false and you are still owed full severance. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. And hey, welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking around through that little break here on the Employment Law Show. Reach out to Lior anytime, by the way, 1-855-821-5900. Email address is help at employmentlawyer.ca. And you can also ask your questions where we're going to go right now. That is terminationquestions.com. Anytime, freely and anonymously. Uh, for this show, Lior, here it comes. After a major depressive episode due to a family loss, my doctor recommended I scale back my work hours. My employer denied the request, suggesting a leave of absence instead. As a 30-year accounting employee, age 62, can I opt for severance instead? What do you think? Well, you know, the employer declined the request. Yeah. The employer doesn't get to decline the request. Right. It's not a request, by the way. The doctor gets to say what you need if you have a medical condition. And in this situation, if the doctor says, no, you need to get less hours, you need to work modified duties, etc., your employer has to make that happen. Yeah, maybe it's easier for the company if you just go off on a medical leave, but it doesn't matter. If you're able to work and your doctor says you are able to work, just, you just need accommodation, your employer has to give you that accommodation, if at all possible. They can't decline, it's not up to them. And if they don't, that's in this situation, now we're just not gonna do it, just go off on a leave, it's easier. That's a human rights violation. Beyond just the fact that it's wrong, it's completely illegal. So what happens here? In this situation, person says, I want to work less hours because my doctor says I need it for health reasons. Employer says no. Well, we have a human rights violation, but also because the company is not allowing this person to work, that's also a constructive dismissal. This person can treat their employment as being terminated and require the company to pay them severance. So next step, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you and show you how much severance this person is owed. For that, as always, we're going to go and use our severance calculator tool. Once more, you can find that at pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Remember, free and anonymous. Let's plug the information in and let's see how much severance this person is owed. So we know that this person's been there for 30 years, 62 years of age, is an accountant, senior account. Well, 24 months, you see right there on the screen, two years of severance is how much this person is owed. Beyond that, of course, there's additional human rights damages too. So this employee was wrong. The good news is, yeah, we can easily help with that. That's a bad move. I, I just, when I was reading the 62, 30 year employee, you knew it was gonna be 24 you months. Knew it. That's a big hit for an employer. Well, and again, beyond that, there's also human rights damages. So it's much more than just the 24 months. You know, we were talking earlier about employees with medical issues, disability. One of the things I said, and this is a perfect example, your employer has to accommodate modified hours, modified duties, whatever it is that your doctor says every single week. I speak with individuals exactly in that situation. They're asking for that accommodation. The company says no. If that sounds familiar or if it happens to you, you call me right away. You can join in weekly on the live stream with uh, Lior and the other lawyers in the firm. By the way, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn as well, at stlawyers.ca, at stlawyers.ca to do so. Uh, from this week, Lior, over the past year, I logged many overtime hours, which my manager assured I would eventually be paid for. However, I was fired earlier this week and given a severance package that does not account for these overtime hours. What should I do? Well, we were talking about earlier, earlier about overtime. So yes, you have to get paid overtime. In this situation, the fact that this person lost their job doesn't mean that they don't get overtime. They get overtime. So number one, 
Yes, they have to get unpaid overtime, but also that overtime counts towards their severance. What I mean by that is if this person's salary usually is $50,000 a year, but with overtime it's $55,000 a year, we have to use $55,000 to calculate their severance. So remember, your overtime, if you work that regularly, is part of your compensation, and that has to be included in your severance. Of course, beyond that, really it includes all components of your compensation. So we mentioned overtime, but also bonuses, commissions, car allowance, all those things would have to be included. It's not just your base salary. So yes, in this particular situation, you better believe their overtime is still owed. And it's interesting, all those other components you, you mentioned, that uh, takes a bit of math when it's a person in the sales position, right? Because it can little be a bit of an ebb and flow up and down. So you take an average, is that how it's done generally? It's as simple as an average. So we may not know exactly what this person's salary or compensation would have been had they stayed on, but we have some history to look at. Whether they worked there for a year or 10 years, we can look at an average and use that average as, as our figure to calculate your severance. So oftentimes, John, I see employers Ba or trying to base severance just on the minimum, on the base salary. It doesn't work that way. It has to include all components of your compensation. If you want to know if something needs to be included, you ask yourself, would I have gotten that had I continued working? And if the answer is yes, it has to be paid. You got it. We always close out the show with our Employment Law Show rapid fire questions to Lior, which we're going to get into right now. All right, number one, if you are forced to resign, Lior, are you owed compensation? Forced. Well, if you can show that you've been forced to resign, it's not voluntary, yes, the law considers that to be a termination. The only time a resignation truly is a resignation is if you do it voluntarily and unilaterally. So if you're forced to resign, make sure that someone knows about that or you write an email saying, I'm only resigning because you told me I had to. In that situation, yeah, you're owed your full severance. Always write it down. Always, cool. if it's not in writing, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. You got it. Number two, are you considered an employee if you've signed multiple contract extensions over time? So not only are you still an employee, you may actually be an indefinite higher employee. What I mean is if you sign many one-year contracts, you, you have a contract you sign, then another, and then another. After about three or so, the law says forget about those contracts. You're now a regular indefinite employee. And why does that matter? It matters because if at some point you're let go, you're going to be owed severance like an indefinite employee, and that could be a very significant amount. Okay, rapid fire number three, Lior. If a business is bought by a new owner, are previous employees automatically hired on? No. So if you're working for a company, that company is sold, you're not automatically hired on. It's up to the company that buys the business to decide whether to take you on. If they don't take you on, your employment presumably is terminated, you're owed severance. If the new company does take you on, they inherit your service. So watch out for those employment agreements. You don't want to sign an employment agreement with the new company that gets rid of that old service. Rapid fire number four, are employers obligated to pay an annual bonus? Well, in some cases they are. So what I mean by that is if you regularly get a bonus and you can count on it and it's always paid a certain amount by a certain date, then it becomes part of your compensation and the company can't just decide we're not going to do it anymore. On the other hand, if sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, it's clearly discretionary, then the company in that situation gets to decide. Hope you're listening, Griswold. We'll move on to a rapid fire question number five. Does your employer have the right to choose when you take vacation? They do. Now, most employers don't do that. Most employers will allow you to decide and they'll approve the vacation. But a company does have the right to say, I've decided you're taking your vacation on this date. So something to always keep in mind. Let me lob an easy one ask you to close out here, Lior. Is severance pay capped at one week per year of work? Well, too easy. Our, 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 our viewers are jumping out of their seats saying, of course not, it's not capped. It's capped at two years, and even that is not necessarily the case. Severance is a lot more than a week per year of service. And with that, we are done. Reach out to Lior anytime until we see you next week or catch one of our radio shows. Uh, you can go to employmentlawyer.ca to find a station near you. Beyond that, the phone number, 1-855-821-5900. And always use that email as well, help at employmentlawyer.ca. And then finally, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. It's free and anonymous with that severance calculator. We'll catch you next time on the Employment Law Show.